eliminate poverty. Microcredit is helpful, like many other things. People, any human life has many dimensions. So you're saying that if I put microcredit, everything will be solved. Somebody is uh, in a fool's paradise. You <laughs> don't understand people's life at all. It's an important thing. Financing is an important thing so that I can start living and earning a living for myself. You need education. You need health care. You need good governance. You need a uh, physical environment where you can work. Uh, and uh, possibilities of your ex expressing your own creative power. So those things are essential. Everything is together. So you, if you say, if I give education, poverty will be gone, that will be again living to the fool's paradise. If you say, if I bring uh, health care to the poor people, poor people automatically will be, that's again. You need everything. But don't miss out the financial part of it. So once you have the financial part, it helps. It becomes helpful. It's a very strong element in the lab, people's life. But you have to add the other pieces also. It's a combined thing. It's a continuous thing. Due to the financial and economic crisis, development funds were cut by the developed countries. Where do you see the responsibility of rich countries in fighting poverty? Where should they act? We have been suggesting many things, for example, uh, how to use this money. You, you have donor money. Donor money mostly going as charities, grants. Um, and I have been arguing that charities don't solve poverty. Charities can, at best, can hide poverty. For the time being, you are eating, you are doing because somebody gave you the food. But that's not removing poverty. You are only hiding that poverty because you provided the food. Tomorrow you stop providing the food, it's back to poverty again. Because you, you give him a house, give him a food. He doesn't look like a poor person anymore because he lives in your charity. So in order to overcome poverty, you have to build the capacity of the person so that he or she can under, uh, undertake the uh, job of creating his own life, her own life, and so on. So that's a very important part. So I was telling about the uh, donor money to go into what we call social business. Business to solve problem that doesn't make money for anybody. Then that money becomes um, recyclable. It goes on using, uh, being used again and again. So it becomes very powerful. So that's another subject that we uh, emphasize that uh, could be done. And social, uh, microcredit could be a social business. You do microcredit not to make money for yourself, and that's what we have done, but to solve the problem of the people so that you can overcome those problems that the loan sharks create for you. We solve that problem. So that's the direction uh, donor money should go, not in a charity fashion. Charity is a wonderful idea. I'm not condemning charity. Charity is a fantastic idea. That's the only thing for ages people have to survive for in distresses and so on. Uh, the charity money comes and solves your problem, but the money doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of your money. If you can convert this into a social business, same thing can be done as a social business. Social business money goes out, solves the problem, and comes back. Then you can reuse the money again and again and again. So it becomes very powerful. So if you compare between the charity and the social business, you see the power of the social business because it is sustainable, it is ex expandable, money keeps on recycling, it never disappears. If the donor money comes out as a charity, it goes out, it doesn't come back. But if that money goes as a social business, then money goes out, solves the problem, and comes back. So you have a repeated use of the same money. And if fresh money comes next year, it becomes bigger and bigger, and then you keep on doing things in a sustainable way. So I would suggest that uh, donor money should be looking for those uh, opportunities to use the social business idea. I would like to ask some questions. Go ahead. Uh, microfinance is, strugg is struggling to find its feet in the Middle East. Uh, different reports say that institutional structures, poor regulations, and general financial system backwardness are hampering microfinance growth in the Middle East, especially MENA region. Where do you see the role of respective countries to make microfinance a success?
I'm glad you asked that question because I'll be in uh, uh, Dubai uh, in two weeks. We are having uh, the microcredit summit in Dubai. All the MENA countries are uh, participating, explaining who, who is doing what and so on. We'll have lots of these ideas. And it's gradually taking roots. Initially, there were confusion about the commercial microcredit versus social microcredit and all that. Now people understand that commercial microcredit is not the way to get to the poor people. It's a, com it's a social microcredit which can help transform the life of the poor people. So that's one direction. But we need policy framework. That's something is not only is missing in the Middle East, it's missing all over the world. Grameen Bank is a bank for the poor. It has its own legal framework. It comes with a legal as a legal entity, as a bank. It has its own law. But the, the, that do law is not generalized. You cannot create Grameen Bank type banks in other countries because the law doesn't exist. There's a banking law in every country. The same in the Middle East, same in Kuwait, everywhere else. That banking law is actually a banking law to create a bank for the rich. You don't have a banking law to create a bank for the poor. These two laws are completely different. You cannot create a bank for the rich and expect that bank for the rich to serve the poor people because it's not designed for that purpose. So you need a law which allows you to create a bank which is designed specifically to deal with the poor people. First thing you do, dismiss the whole idea of collateral because you don't need a collateral. And if you raise a question, it can be possible. Grameen Bank is an example. Microcredit all over the world is examples. It's been done, demonstrated. It has been proven again and again. So that's not an issue. But still, you don't have it. So you ask the rich people's bank to give land, to lend money to the poor people. They get stuck with their procedure, and they cannot take the next step. So they get stuck with their own policies. What we are trying to do with the Middle East, uh, with Ek Fund, Arab Gulf Fund, uh, with Prince Talal, who took the idea of microcredit to his heart, and he's trying to set up banks in each country, uh, microcredit banks, in the way that Grameen Bank has done. Now we have nine countries in the Middle East which has a microcredit bank from, supported by uh, ACFUN. I'm sure there are many other organizations who are doing that. So they're, they're all becoming there, and there are many NGOs who are doing that. Abdul Latif Jamil in uh, Saudi Arabia, he has his Jamil Foundation, uh, uh, which supports microcredit programs exactly following the Grameen principles and so on. There are many other programs. I'm not saying that uh, these are the only two examples that I could give. But these are small programs. One bank cannot change everything. So you have to create lots of many banks to make it happen. I'm sure, I hope uh, Kuwait will do that, create a bank for the poor to address the uh, poor people, to provide the service. Credit is only one service. When I say financial service, there are many more. You have the savings, you have the insurance, you have the pension funds, you have investment funds, all kinds of social business funds. Many things can be done. And there are plenty of money in the Middle East. But that money doesn't go down the ladder to reach out to the poor people in a sustainable way. Lots of money is used, and the jakat money is used, and many other money. Charity money is used, foundation money is used. Always in the mode of a charity. Always giving the people, poor people, to say, I will take care of you. And that's a wrong policy. You don't take care of anybody. Individuals take care of themselves because everybody has the creative power. All you do, unleash, help them unleash their own creative power. That is the solution. Unless we help people to unleash their creative power, problem is not going to be solved. Social business issue, you already mentioned about it. You came up with an idea of social business which you say is a kind of new capitalism. Please describe this idea to us and speak a little bit about how you came to that idea. I didn't come this as a theory. I was doing microcredit lending money and I see a lot of problems besides just the credit problem, besides the loan shark problem, their problem of healthcare. It's very simple. If you are a poor person, it being synonymous that a poor person is also poor in health. It goes together. So how to address the health issue of the poor people? 
And if you're poor, you most likely you're illiterate. You never had a chance to go to school because circumstances never allowed you to go to school and go through the education process. So poverty becomes a bundle of many other problems. So I keep seeing that when I'm giving loans. I said, maybe I should try to address other issues also. So I started doing that. And in the process, what I did, I started creating a business to solve the problem. And it became a habit with me. Whenever I try to address a problem of the poor people, I create a business to address that problem. And gradually, I created many, many such businesses, one on healthcare, one on technology, one on uh, agriculture, and so on. And they, all of them have a common feature. Feature, I didn't want to make money for myself. And you know, these are businesses, they make money, they uh, return their investments and so on. The common feature that I see that uh, I'm coming up with, that I'm not interested in making money for myself. Then people say, well, then why are you making these companies if you're not making money for themselves? I said, because I want to solve problems. Some of these businesses became nationwide pro programs. It's not just a tiny little business in the corner of a shop. It's a huge business. Like we do solar energy in Bangladesh. We, because in the villages there is no electricity. So what we did, we created a company called Gramin Shokti or Gramin Energy. And started introducing the solar energy, solar home system. Even if you're a small household, you can buy a solar home system and you have electricity of your own. You don't have to get connected with the national grid. National grid doesn't exist for you. In the village, there is no national grid. National grid is only for the cities. You call it national grid, but it's actually a city grid. It's not a national grid. So we said, why do you have to live on the kerosene? Why don't you have the solar system? And gradually, in the beginning, it's very difficult to convince people to buy such system to do that. It's expensive. But we explain how economics works, because the money that you spend on kerosene, if you put together, you get a whole solar home system. You just give the money for the kerosene that you spend, and we give you the solar home system for three years. The money that you spend for three years on kerosene, that buys you a solar home system, which goes on for 30 years. You don't have to pay any penny after that. People started liking that. Today, we have one and a half million households with the solar home system everywhere in the world. Now, many other NGOs like that, they are introducing solar home system. So it became a big company. The question is, did I want to make money out of this company? No, I had no idea of making money. And every other company that I created is the same principle. Then people say, mm, this is not really a company. I said, why not? I am created under the Companies Act. So why shouldn't you call it a company? You're not making money. I said, I don't want to make money. Can you force me to make money? Then why do you do that? Because I want to solve problems. Then I thought, maybe this is a new kind of business. That's why it's difficult for people to understand. So I started giving a name. I call it social business and define it. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. I said, can this be a company like that? Of course, if you want it, why not? There is no law that says you cannot create a company that you cannot take dividend out of it. If I decide not to take dividend out of it, it's my decision because I want to concentrate on solving the problem. So idea of that social business became very popular. Now many countries in the world are following that social business, creating social business in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. We have uh, social businesses in many countries in Europe, like in France, there are lots of social businesses that are being created there. Universities like that, they're teaching social business courses. They create social business centers within the university to teach courses, do research, and so on. So gradually, it's getting kind of a traction that, yes, this is something to be done. Otherwise, if you create a business for making money, which is the normal way you have seen over years, that is pushing us in a certain direction because this is a money-centric business. All you want to do is make money. You couldn't care less what happens to other people. As a result, you create a lot of problems for other people. And you never had a chance to solve that within your business because you're focused on making money. The more money you make, the more happy you get. But you are not aware that you created problems for other people. And then you say, I pay taxes. Government should solve all those problems. I create the problem, government should solve the problem. I said, that's not the way it should be done. 
And government has a limitation how, how much problem they can solve. And they can only solve problem through bureaucracy, through charities, and such kinds of things. And that doesn't go very far. Why don't you come bring business idea into doing that? So many big companies now have joint ventures with us so that they can create social business. Like Danone of France, they have, have joint venture with us in Bangladesh as a social business. They don't want to make money out of it. They want to solve the problem of malnutrition because children are malnourished. Most of the children are malnourished in Bangladesh, almost half of them. So this is one step. They, they have the technology, they bring the technology, they create special kind of yogurt with all the micronutrients which is missing in the children and then make it very cheap. Because if your mind is now to solve the problem of the poor, you come up with all the ideas how to make it cheaper, how to make it more efficient, how to make it sure that it's available. So that's how they, they are very good at that. But they're using those talents to make money before. Now, once the social business ideas use the same talent to solve the problem of the poor in a social business way. So this is an idea. We have joint ventures with the BSF of Germany to bring mosquito nets. Bangladesh is a malaria country, and new diseases keep coming with the malaria-borne diseases, or uh, mosquito-borne diseases. So we create a mosquito nets, which is treated mosquito nets. People feel safe. You can buy the mosquito nets in the market and do it, make it very cheap, make it uh, available in the villages and so on. So we have a lot of those joint ventures coming up in Bangladesh and other countries. So gradually, uh, we see a new kind of economy where there'll be two kinds of business. Business to make money, business to solve problem of the people. And let people decide which one they want, whether they want to take this one or they want to take that one, or they want to take both. Half of their money goes into making money, half of their money goes into solving people's problem in a business way, where the investor can take